Hi students, welcome to Year 11 Biology and module number three, Biological Diversity. This is video number 11 and we're going to delve a little bit uh, in this video into the evolution of the horse. Our learning intention in this video is to analyze how an accumulation of microevolutionary changes can drive evolutionary change in speciation over time and use the example of evolution in the horse in order to um, try and support this idea. So what do we know about horse evolution? And I think one of the most important things is that horse evolution is one of the um, prime examples that's often used to talk about um, not just uh, examples that we see of evolution occurring, but also um, that's used to bring the fossil record into our uh, areas of evidence in support for the theory of evolution. And that is um, because of the, the differences that we see in different types of horses uh, over geological time. But I think a deeper look is probably required because often the picture of horse evolution can um, indicate a linearity that isn't there. So let's have a little bit of a look at horse evolution in a little bit more detail in this video. Firstly, the Dawn horse, or the first horse that we recognise, uh, comes from rocks of around about 55 million years in age. We see divergence, that is, we see evolution that occurred, that actually moved, that actually moved the, um, the animals, the organisms, away from uh, their original populations, and we saw changes occurring. Uh, in these particular groups over time. What we need to do is we need to analyse the changes that we see and to try and determine whether we're talking about microevolution, that is evolution that's kind of occurring within populations which is maybe shifting them. Um, a, probably a better example of that is something like the peppered moths where we see um, favour uh, conditions, changes in the environment which favour a lighter colour uh, or other changes which may favour a darker colour, but, but substantially no major speciation, no major change that's occurring in the actual um, uh, species itself. And contrast that with macroevolution, which is really um, above species level, so above species. So when the, um, when the changes that we see seem to occur for organisms that have some broad relationship to each other so that we do recognise them as similar, but certainly wouldn't um, consider them to be part of the same species, then that's getting into the area of macroevolution. And of course, macroevolution and speciation tend to go together because uh, what we see in macroevolution is changes that are occurring at a higher um, than species level and therefore the changes that are occurring are regarded as being uh, different species. Now of course when you're talking about fossils you don't uh, and a definition of species is uh, organisms which can breed uh, successfully to produce uh, fertile offspring. Now we don't know that that's the case when we know organisms from fossils but we can make certain conclusions about that. Uh, and certainly what we want to do is to examine horses uh, in enough detail to try and identify some of these key differences, particularly in the development and changes in dentition and also in their, um, in their toes, in their um, limbs. So we want to have a look at a couple of these in a little bit of detail. So this is probably the most common kind of chart that you would get when you're looking at horse evolution. And of course, one of the problems with this is it kind of indicates a certain linearity, a certain um, this developed into this, which developed into this, and so on, and so on. And effectively, each new, um, new and improved version of horses just basically outcompeted the old ones. And so they all disappeared from the fossil record um, after a certain period of time. And we only find the um, more successful ones uh, in the younger rocks. Of course, up to today, where we find uh, Equus is the uh, genus for the horse. What we do know from some of the studies that we've done is that there were changes in the climate. So a cooler climate to a warmer climate. Uh, changes in the uh, nature of the vegetation from soft forest leaves to harsher grasses. And of course, food 
is strongly tied to dentition. It's also tied to a digestive system changes as well. And sometimes one of the simplest changes is just the size of the body. If you're going to be eating food that requires a lot of processing, uh, a lot of time for uh, fermentation and breakdown, then you often need a bigger body because you need a bigger stomach to hold all of that. Um, so those are some of the changes that can occur as a result of these other sorts of changes that are happening. But certainly if you're going to eat food that is going to be very hard on your teeth, that's going to wear them down, having um, longer crowns, having um, teeth that are a little more resistant to that sort of food is going to be a better survival um, characteristic than not. So we do find this um, shift in dentition towards what we call hypsodont teeth. And hypsodont teeth are just these ones with these massive crowns. So you look at the, the part of the tooth that's basically sticking out um, above the gum line and you get that sense of what the crown is like. And certainly the modern horses have a, have a very well-developed uh, long crown and that helps them to deal with these harsher types of foods. We definitely know that there's a size increase. We definitely can see differences in the very small um, Hurricotherium, which is our dawn horse, our early horse, that we've, we find uh, the youngest horse-like um, thing that we can find. Uh, and then the, the size is increasing as we go along. And of course, probably one of the most famous changes that's occurring to uh, horses is this reduction in the number of toes. So that the early horses had um, uh, the full complement of toes. And as they kind of um, ran on that central toe, uh, the other ones around it, which weren't being used, were being lost till the point where we had that one single reinforced um, single toe, if you like, which is what we see in modern horses is just the one. Now, the question, of course, is whether this is orthogenic evolution, whether this is suggested of a linear pattern that you just had a progression from one through to the next, through to the next, through to the next. Um, and there is a, a significant amount of evidence to suggest that, firstly, that um, this rarely happens um, to our understanding in uh, evolution. It's much more diverse than this. And in fact, when we look at horses, uh, we also find that the pattern of horse evolution is very much a divergent branching pattern um, rather than a, a linear development from one species to the next. So in actual fact, um, the pattern of, of development and change uh, within horse diversity looks a little bit more like this. Now, this is a fairly complex um, phylogenetic tree and certainly not something that you want to try and be memorizing or anything like that. The key points about this are to try and look at the relationship between food and the resultant changes that occurred both in size and also in dentition. And what you see when we look at a tree like this is we, we can remove that idea of orthogenesis. We, we can remove that idea of linearity from one to the next to the next. There's clearly a diversity here. And there's uh, very well can be overlap between different types of species. And of course, there's a number of different examples of this uh, all around the biological world. Uh, and it's important that we are aware of the fact that now, particularly with advances that have occurred in biochemistry techniques, in understanding the structure of DNA, in being able to produce the genome of so many different organisms now, we're learning so much more about the relationships between different types of organisms, including and, um, and I guess, facilitating the development of these sorts of family trees. So when we look at horse evolution, horse phylogeny, it's not a simple matter of a linear development from one little tiny dog-like horse um, to the modern horse, but there's a great diversity in um, adaptive radiation that's occurred in horses and that these changes have occurred in response to changes in the environment, uh, particularly changes in vegetation, which have driven some of the changes that we see um, having occurred in the, in the horses over time. The important thing is that you can argue the case of what the evidence suggests um, 
And the fact that that same evidence has been interpreted in different ways is, is always part of the story for things like uh, fossil evidence. When we're piecing together, when we're putting these sorts of puzzles together, it's very important that we can um, observe carefully and do our reconstructions uh, and gather as much evidence as we can for those for those um, sequences that we have uh, when we put all of these different types of family trees together. So the horse is just one example, but, but quite a useful example for us to look at how evolution can occur, particularly things like macroevolution, where we're looking at speciation, radiation beyond the species level into uh, a number of different and quite distinct groups. Thanks for watching.